Hello, everyone. My name is Alexis Grant. I am one of the instructors of this course, Epidemics of Injustice, here at the UIC School of Public Health. Um, before we get started with our great speaker tonight, for those who are visiting, we want to give a little overview of what this course is while we're here. So this course, Epidemics of Injustice, is free and open to the public and it's designed to prepare public health leaders um, and community members with tools to bring about social change to address structural determinants of health. So this year, our theme is resistance, revolution, and rebellion through public health. So all of our lectures week to week and our action labs week to week uh, are centered around this topic. And this course is sponsored by the Collaboratory for Health Justice at the School of Public Health. Before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge um, that UIC sits on lands that were the traditional territories of the Three Fires people. And we just want to acknowledge those who um, have come before us and whose land that we sit on and are benefiting from. So this week, our topic is using public health data. And with us, we have Dr. Michael Kalis from the UIC School of Public Health. Uh, he re received his uh, civic engineering diploma from the National Polytechnic University of Athens, Greece. He earned his master's and PhD in civil engineering from McGill University in Canada. And now he's an associate professor for the Division of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences the UIC School of Public Health and the Director of the Public Health Geographic Information Systems and Emergency Management and Resilience Planning online certificate programs. His research interests include environmental quality monitoring network design, environmental data analysis, risk assessment and management, geostatistical applications, and low environmental impact cost benefit analysis. For more than 20 years, he has been involved in low impact touristic development projects in the Eastern Mediterranean region. So we are very excited to have Dr. Kalis here with us today. And with that, I will pass it off. Um, oh, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I just have to share again my screen. And then we can get started. Um, Uh, is can, can can everybody see the slides properly? We see the whole PowerPoint window. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from beginning. Okay. Here you go. This is much better, I think. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So, so what we'll be talking uh, today is is uh, the use of dashboards as a tool as a tool to to analyze things as well, but mainly to as a tool to to promote and advocate issues. And what an issue at the end uh, that I hope we'll have time to examine is the uh, equitable vaccine allocation. So of course, before I start, I have to thank my collaborators. It's, it, we're quite a big team uh, and a lot of them are, are experts uh, in, in GIS and in, in data analytic uh, applications. Uh, and, and environmental, of course, uh, data analysis. So before we, we talk about dashboards and, and the information they can, could convey, uh, we'll need to focus on data. Data for many reasons during this uh, pandemic have been ignored, I guess because of the you know, severe consequences of the disease. Uh, so, so, Data, I mean, it, it, it's fundamental, <laughs> um, are generated by phenomena. And what we're interested in is the phenomena that generates them as well as the quality of, of data that we can uh, uh, collect for that phenomenon. Now, one issue is that uh, uh, because of the uh, rush to publish, as many of you know, uh, data quality issues and limitations have been unnoticed in publications uh, 
uh, unnoticed, quote unquote, I'm really not sure, but they were not uh, stated clearly. Uh, so that I think will create a problem or, or creates a problem for a lot of people that uh, uh, doubt the uh, findings of, uh, of, of scientists. Uh, so, as I said, we're going to be focusing on the phenomenon, on data, data quality, information, and knowledge. Um, the structure of the presentation is we'll, we'll focus first on data and 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 the quant the consequences uh, of ignoring cer certain properties uh, that they have. Uh, then we'll try to understand how information is derived in, in various forms, uh, tabular forms, graphical forms, and, and try to link that uh, information with the phenomenon and some conclusions, some very interesting conclusions. And then uh, at the end, uh, there's going to be, a, I hope, a, 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 an in-depth discussion about um, disseminating information in the form of dashboards. Now, one thing that I won't be able to cover is uh, uh, data information and knowledge, okay? Uh, as uh, probably all of you know, each concept, each uh, term here is worth probably a few uh, uh, lectures by itself, okay? Uh, one thing you have to keep in mind is that uh, these three terms cannot be used interchangeably in at least uh, in, this, in, in this context that uh, we're working on, or at least we, we never use them interchangeably, okay? Now, um, as I always like uh, to do, um, I, I want to present uh, uh, the methodology for, for analyzing our data. Um, the problem, of course, is that, that since we're dealing with data, information, and knowledge, uh, we're entering a, a, a field that is uh, uh, mainly an issue of uh, philosophical debate. Um, the only, one thing, though, that we've learned from this debate, uh, and I'm not sure if, if, if we, we covered this issue in the school, uh, names like Kuhn, Lekatos, and some other uh, philosophers are prominent in this debate, um, including as well uh, a few uh, references that uh, the reading material presented. Uh, but regardless of the, uh, regardless of the debate, uh, one thing we know is that uh, there is a threshold, a threshold of evidence, of proof, of confirmation, if, if you believe in not believe if you're a, 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 if you know how to apply the Bayesian approach or, or testing. So there is a threshold beyond which uh, what uh, we find is sufficiently enough to support uh, statements and, and be elevated knowledge. One thing we have to really, really be careful of, and, and it's obvious um, in, in our field, in the public health field, is not to confuse uh, knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge with opinion and beliefs. Uh, then as your, uh, as your reading material states, uh, we're, we're degrading debates uh, into uh, believers of, uh, uh, of uh, non-climate change or sometimes even uh, flat earth uh, society. Um, uh, proponents. Now, in, in, in your reading material, there's a, a very interesting uh, discussion about uh, two uh, very antithetical, uh, let's say, methodological poles. One is the positivist. Uh, that's kind of well known and, and, and quite old, actually, in natural sciences, including engineering that I was trained in is a very strong component. And the other one is something called a theoretical, uh, which is, I guess, a colloquial expression by the author. Um, 
we will try to avoid these, this polarity and, and, and as I said before, try to focus on the threshold and sufficient evidence and gener generating sufficient evidence with a systematic way in, in order to, to substantiate our findings and, 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 our, and our work. Um, as one of my old teachers uh, was saying, if, if your approach is systematic and well structured, um, the, the data, the information, and eventually the knowledge you're gonna uh, uh, generate uh, will be sufficient to, uh, you know, to, 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 to win a debate with any uh, opponent. Uh, though debate is not, you know, the objective is not to win the uh, debate. The, the objective is to discuss, to, to have a, an open exchange, a critical exchange, and, and maybe even advance your uh, position uh, in a critical way. So uh, for those that are familiar, there is a, a, recent, a recent, relatively recent development in the, this philosophical debate about methodology, uh, which more or less uh, advocates that uh, knowledge that's generated uh, uh, with um, sufficient in a sufficiently systematic way uh, can be regarded as scientific knowledge, and it differs from everyday uh, knowledge. The you know the so-called facts uh, uh, and undeniably facts that a lot of people are using these days. So one, one way that we are using to analyze data is the, the, the CRISP, uh, cross-industry standard process um, approach, um, which is very common in the uh, data sciences field. Um, you might say that it's a very technocratic approach. Uh, the big benefit of, of of this is that it, it provides, it, you can maximize the level of proof uh, that you need to substantiate your, uh, your, your findings. And this is critical um, as we will see for uh, public health research issues. So now let's go to, the, to our understanding of the phenomenon, okay? Uh, when the epidemic first appeared, we were uh, kind of puzzled because, you know, in, in our lifetime, we, we haven't seen something similar. Um, you know, there, there was the, the previous uh, pandemic, but it was not as severe as this one. Um, after talking to some people that are experts in the field, they told me that there was a in 1918 and 1919, uh, 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 an, uh, an equally devastating pandemic. So the first, let's say, um, uh, information we extracted from, from, from the old studies, okay, is that uh, this pandemic has uh, phases, waves as well, and, and for, modeling purposes, which, which we'll not discuss uh, today, um, this pandemic uh, resembles very much, uh, this pandemic in terms of a wave, the uh, Monod model uh, of bacterial growth that you can see on the right side. Uh, yeah, this one here. Okay. Uh, Monod, uh, um, a great uh, uh, scientist, uh, Nobel Prize winner as well, uh, with very simple techniques managed to model uh, bacterial growth and, and kind of identified six phases. Uh, for whatever reason, and I, I'm, I'm really not an expert to talk about this, uh, we found out that um, the current pandemic resembles very much this trend, okay, this trend of bacterial growth. Um, some friends that are in the field uh, talk about forever about these, uh, these similarities, but 
as I said, I'm, I'm not in a position to repeat what they're saying, okay? But anyway, let's go back now to our, uh, to our uh, observational evidence, okay? Uh, in this case, for our study, what we want to do is, uh, is to um, find reliable uh, data that describe the pandemic. For our purpose, what we've, we selected is basically mortality. Uh, mortality we, starting at, at a Cook County level and then going to Midwest, we can actually go to a national level as well. Um, one question that I have for you, uh, since you guys are all working in the public health field and it's something you have to think is, why not use positive cases? A lot of publications that are out, 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 out there, okay, used positive cases. Uh, so it's something you should think, okay? Um, with the information we'll provide later on, you'll, you'll probably understand why we didn't do, uh, use positive cases. Okay, there's levels of uh, granulations we have to achieve that are not possible with positive cases. So for the main study that we've done, Cook County and Chicago, we use the medical examiner's data and we'll have a few examples with details of how this database looks uh, and we will be able to discuss about data, data quality and a lot of the issues that we encounter. More details, uh, 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 please, for more details, please go to the um, uh, links that are provided in the document that's circulating. Uh, and I really uh, uh, want to point out that you should read the, the limitations, okay, of the data sources. So that, that's critical here, why? Because uh, the sources, the, the portals that provide the data are by themselves identifying limitations that sometimes researchers ignore. Okay, back to our data understanding and preparation phase. Um, for, for those familiar with uh, the data analytic sciences approach, uh, which is modified here, this is not the uh, the original CRISP approach, okay, we modified it for our classes and our work. Data preparation understanding is the, the most critical, probably, element of, 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 of a project involving data. Um, Time-wise, if you kind of want to assess it, it's almost 40% of the project, depending, of course, uh, as we say, uh, on how, how much dirty the data is. And, and there's no ending here. I can go 40, maybe 30, but, but sometimes it can go up to 40, 40 and 60% of the, of the time that some researchers have to spend uh, with their data. Uh, one very critical element that again is lacking in many of the publications that you'll see, especially at, in the early phase of the pandemic is, uh, the lack of criteria and assumptions that they've used for their data. Uh, a lot of those publications uh, quote briefly the, um, the sources, but they, they, they don't go into the, the limitations, the data limitations. Uh, so as, as we learn in our classes, all over the academia world, uh, uh, if you intervene in the original raw data structure in any way, you have to uh, note, uh, state it, and then of course you have to justify it. And that as well is a, is a fundamental principle for people doing data analytics work. Um, okay, so what is our, so we have a database uh, that in, includes records and those records, uh, uh, have, of course, the death, the causes of death, location, um, 
We're fortunate with the uh, medical examiner's data to have race, age, address, and in some cases, even uh, uh, geographic coordinates. So for us, the way we started this uh, project is that we selected as our major uh, data quality criterion, the location, the address of the records. Um, the why, I guess I, I'm stating it here as a question, uh, uh, will be uh, very, very well uh, understood later on when we go to aggregations. Now, uh, by doing so, by selecting uh, you know, uh, the address, the location as, as the major criterion, uh, we have to remove observations that lack um, uh, uh, an address structure. Address structure means number and street name. Uh, as you will see with the original data that I'm gonna be showing you, uh, there are records that lack this information or it's incomplete sometimes. Let's go to the example. Um, so can you, uh, I don't wanna ask a question, I guess because it's quite a big class and I'm used to small ones. So from, from this table, from this list of, of uh, records, uh, the obvious uh, observations that are removed based on our criterion is uh, 6011 and 6819. In one case, as you can see, it doesn't have any um, location information. In another, it has a zip code uh, 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 attribute. Uh, there is a debate here, why? Because, well, let's say if you were, were going to do a study at a zip code level, do you want to remove the first, the 6011 uh, record? Um, this is, again, this depends on the objectives of your study. Uh, in our case, uh, even, even though we aggregated at a zip code level, we still remove those observations. And, and there's another reason later on, you'll see, you, you, you'll understand why. So uh, those two observations were removed. Anything else strange here? And, and again, this is not totally accurate, but the address attribute is, is authentic. Uh, one thing you can see, and there are many, many other uh, you know, uh, situations is that the, the, the characters used in the name uh, for specifying the name are, are sometimes capital, sometimes um, small letters, and sometimes they're even um, spelled with symbols. Uh, take a look at 6415. As you can see next to West, there's um, a symbol sign. Now, for for let's say um, pure statistical purposes, the address, I guess, is not very important. The zip code, it's, it, it, especially if you're going to aggregate at a zip code level. Uh, what we did in our work is we went beyond the, the you know, purely statistical level of analyzing data and we uh, basically applied geostatistical techniques. So one thing you have to keep in mind, as soon as you um, try to map your data, your data ha have to have um, a, a very uh, good uh, location descriptor. If you were, let's say, to input uh, these, you know, 10 records in a geocoding uh, platform, a platform that converts addresses to X, Y coordinates, uh, you'll see that uh, the uh, 6415 uh, record will, will give you something 
uh, we call it non conversion non conversion um, uh, uh, record. Okay, uh, it won't give you coordinates. Let us continue. Uh, another important aspect of, 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 of let's say, space-related studies is that we want to define our study area. Uh, for those familiar with Cook County, um, the, you, you can see here that there is uh, a city and a zip code that's not really within uh, Cook County. So again, uh, this record has been, well, in our study uh, was flagged and was not used for, for further study. So those are the, let's say, basic um, data quality steps that we've took uh, to, to identify um, uh, usable records. Now, the, the process we applied is, is, is much more complicated, but those are the basic, because basic initial steps. The second, the, the second finding, let's say, in this database is that um, they, they do not identify um, records that are in uh, locations such as, um, let's say, dormitories, prisons, hospitals, or something called long-term care facilities. Uh, a simple way, again, um, this is the, the, uh, the simple way we apply, but, but in, in, in when you're using a database uh, uh, management software, there are more sophisticated ways to, sophisticated ways to do this job. Uh, we had to identify uh, the, observa the observations, the records that, uh, that constitute uh, coincide points. Coincide points is a geographic, geostatistical term, and we'll see what it signifies. So as you can see here, there are two observations uh, they're, you know, they're clearly indicated. Uh, the, the, the name is different, uh, but by, by simple, uh, let's say sort, a, a simple sorting technique, you can identify that they are the same. Uh, they are the same as well, uh, because they have the uh, same zip code. Now with a different zip code and this problem in terms of naming, uh, uh, the, the classification would have been different, okay? So these two records are records of deaths occurring in a, a care facility. So what we found from the pre preliminary analysis that was early April uh, that the uh, medical examiner's database was starting to be populated is that this database contains uh, coincident points, which are LTCFs. That's how we were going to call them. Uh, in some cases, and that's very important if you're going to do a geostatistical study, uh, there are multiple deaths in one location, usually high rises, residential high rises. Uh, in our, for the first wave, just to give you an example, 4% of the observations in our database were um, uh, multiple death uh, uh, locations of, in, our, in residential neighborhoods, uh, you know, mainly high rises. And in, in some cases, which is very interesting, um, in the high rises uh, under the Chicago high Housing Authority. Uh, the other thing, of course, that we found out is that uh, a lot of these uh, coincident points are hospitals and correctional facilities. Uh, Percentage-wise, percentage uh, they constitute like less than 2%. Now, we kept the LTCFs for sure, the multiple deaths as well in residential settings. That's a very valid observation, but we, rem we removed, actually, we didn't remove, we tagged 
specifically the hospitals and correctional facilities. So we did not include them in further analysis. So this is the beginning of our project and we managed to create a, a database, uh, a, 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 let's say a, a, a relatively uh, clean database that took a lot of time. Uh, the importance of LTCFs at the beginning was totally ignored. Uh, there was an uproar uh, from associations um, related to care facilities. Why? Because they saw their members, uh, you know, uh, being devastated by the pandemic. And there was no real official number. Things started, um, you know, uh, reports started to appear about these uh, cases uh, sometime in May and the federal CMS um, created a, a portal that reports specifically those um, uh, cases. The big problem of course with uh, public health departments, I, I guess by the way the operate is that the death numbers that you see are death numbers uh, related to the overall population. So the overall population includes more or less all the deaths, uh, residential, LTCFs, uh, hospitals, uh, dormitories, whatever. Um, and here I'm giving you uh, an idea. So, so in, in in the, the portals they have, IDPH, the Illinois Department of Public Health, uh, they report very well the deaths at a county level, and they report as well the LTCF uh, per facility. So you can get the number of deaths per facility, and for whatever reason, the facilities are uh, tagged by a name, not an address. The only good thing, of course, is you know at least the county in which those facilities are. And you can see here are three facilities and the way they're reported by the IDPH. So this creates major problems, major analytical problems um, uh, that, that really uh, researchers have to think. Uh, the, the, so, so we started thinking about these problems as well. And, and one solution we found is that if you want to analyze your data uh, at a community level, you really need to separate the observations, the records, uh, and separate them in terms of LTCFs and HP. HP is the household, household residential population. Um, the methodology we developed to do that is basically a, a data mining methodology, um, a data analytic methodology. And, and as you can see in the, in the links we provide, especially the last one, the third dashboard, um, it works. Uh, and, and we have other criteria as well to verify that. Now, the big problem, if you ignore uh, these two populations, uh, which have totally different characteristics. Uh, as, as probably most of you know, uh, care facilities are densely populated facilities. They share a lot of common grounds, activities, including dining and, and enter entertainment, uh, which means of course that uh, transmission, especially in the initial phase, was uh, devastating. Uh, on the other hand, HB residential neighborhoods are residential neighborhoods, okay? Uh, sometimes based on uh, socioeconomic um, characteristics, uh, they're densely populated, in other cases they're not. So the issue here is that if you do not separate uh, these two populations, 
uh, your conclusions, the conclusions that you're going to be drawing about the um, uh, distribution of mortality within your study area will probably be wrong. And in, in the uh, Cook County case, our first publication clearly shows that. Uh, the other thing, practical, let's say, uh, uh, consequence is that if you do not separate the two populations, then you cannot reliably assess uh, hotspots. And this is critical for mitigation uh, measures. So if you want to identify, let's say, a zip code uh, and, and the surrounding area that's uh, highly impacted by um, by COVID and you use the overall population instead of the residential HP uh, population, your hotspot analysis will be totally biased. And lastly, uh, which is something that we keep on pointing out uh, and, and, and we, I haven't found a satisfactory yet report um, underlying this in publications is that for, for pandemic data, the time, the time scale dimension cannot be ignored. And we'll see what we mean about that. So let's go to, um, we gave you the link to this paper, I hope. Um, it's the first publication. The, it's a simple, let's say, uh, table showing uh, percentage per column and, and row, that's, that's, that's simple enough, I think. Uh, but the most important thing is that we, uh, we pro provide here the numbers in terms of overall population, LTCF population, and HP residential population. Uh, for most, most uh, reporting agencies, especially at the beginning, uh, the bottom overall population numbers were used. As you can see, for Cook County, um, uh, the death, death percentages or mortality percentages are 39, 19, and 33. Um, those were the, not, now these numbers, especially for the minority groups are, are still significant, why? Because in terms of overall population, those uh, those minorities are are you know are in the in the black case, they're thirty percent of the overall Chicago population. Now, if you separate the data um, into the two constituent parts that we met, I mentioned before, uh, things become really clear, and the disparities. Uh, are obvious. Why? The percent of death uh, for the, the, the Black and Latino is higher than the percent of death for whites. Of course, the explanation for this is that the LTCF population, the white population, is very significant. So one, not conclusion, one finding here and that goes to at the information level that we can feed uh, public health officials is that you really need to separate your data. What we've done, uh, in, because we want to somehow uh, give more detailed information to communities is uh, we picked up the 10 highest zip codes in terms of mortality, mortality numbers. We're not talking about rate now. Huh? And as you can see, again, the results confirm that the two major minorities, um, ethnic minorities of um, Chicago are the hardest hit. Uh, in this table, you can see that the highest zip code um, of, uh, of uh, white deaths uh, does cannot does not even go near to the tenth uh, Latino or or black uh, um, uh, death zip code. 
the averages are equally astonishing, as you can see. And one comparison that you can make is that is for the 60623 uh, zip code that, well, if you're not familiar, it's just south west from UIC, from the UIC campus. Um, it includes as well uh, a, a very interesting uh, neighborhood called uh, Little Village, as well as Pilsen Park that, that right now we, my team is working on. So the so comparison- Professor, uh, we had a yes. question. So Amy Perfect. Bailey asked- um, Perfect, I cannot students? see the, sorry, what? Can, can you go back, can you please repeat it? Yeah, so the question was, are these incident num incidents numbers or rates? No, no. I, as I said, these are raw, raw mortality numbers. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Rate comes later. Uh, there's no need to do uh, rates here. Why? Because uh, you know, for this specific example, uh, the uh, each race, let's say in six oh six to three, is about thirty percent. Thirty, thirty-one, and thirty-two. Okay. Um, so, so, and, and plus, we wanted to convey this. Um, this table to, to the 606 to three and some nearby communities that we know. Uh, so this is from a work that we, uh, uh, we published in the local newspaper. And, and explaining rates to, to people uh, is, is much more difficult than just showing them the numbers. One thing I don't know if you can notice that that is uh, very striking and, and kind of signifies the importance of separating your data to, from LTCF and HP is, is, is if you take a look at the zip codes in the overall uh, population um, uh, mortality column, uh, th th there's really no um, uh, coincidence as we say uh, in terms of the ranking. So you cannot find the first zip code of the overall mortality in any of the um, uh, race mortality columns. Same, that, that 606 to three appears, but uh, again, uh, it, it's, 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 it is for us, especially the 60649, and this confirms the validity of separating the data as well. There are other ways to confirm that, but let me continue. Any other questions? Sorry, but I, I totally minimized the um, participants' um, window, so I cannot see your, uh, your hands. So again, 10 top zip codes. And this time, uh, what we've done is uh, we focused on LTCF, the LTCF HP uh, uh, disparity. And as you can see from the averages at the bottom row, okay, they are really uh, striking. What we've done as well to give some more context to, to, to this table is we, we created a rate. And this rate is uh, the PM um, dot GQ. So it's the um, as you, percent mortality PM uh, based on group quarter numbers per zip code. It's an approximation, a rather good approximation for the population living in uh, LTCFs. Why? Because the Census Bureau uh, enumerates uh, these people in a different way from the residential popula population and it classifies uh, them as uh, living in group quarters. So we use that. And the rate, as you can see, is astonishing. Uh, in one case, it's 3.8 for the white population, and for the black, it's 5%. It's astonishing why the overall population mortality rate of Chicago was 0.1%. So you can immediately see the devastation that the um, LTCF community suffered uh, during the first phase and the second phase, of course, of the uh, disease. Any questions? Uh, okay. Okay. 
We don't have any questions right now. Sorry, what? Perfect. Sorry, sorry, what? Yeah. There's sorry. no questions right now, but if anyone oh, okay. has any, feel free to drop those in the chat or raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, please. So, so we have the data. It's, you know, our data at least is in early July. So why don't we test some fancy assumptions and, and come up with really, you know, striking results, I guess, or publications if you want. <laughs> okay. The issue here is that, uh, and, and this, this is something that uh, the, the, the reading material you provided uh, was, was really good, okay, and I'm quoting it here, is you have to look at your data. As we said before, uh, the pandemic follows a wave. So if you're, let's say, mid-wave, okay, in the middle of your wave, what conclusions can you draw? It's very, very critical. Why? Because for analyzing this kind of data, and mind you, I'm in the environmental field, and environmental data are very difficult by default. Uh, this, this database uh, really, really uh, made us work hard and think hard because it's, it's based on waves and, and, and the waves, as we will see later on with the dashboards have totally different spatial distributions. As a minimum, what we've done is to accept that a wave, in order to analyze it, has to uh, stabilize in terms of number of deaths. So let's say, you know, it reaches the uh, bottom plateau phase of the Monod curve. And something else that we really, really pay, paid a, a lot of attention to is the new areas, the areas, the zip codes, block groups, or whatever was our scale of measurement. So what we want is basically the phenomenon, the wave the, uh, of the phenomenon to be fully established and manifested. Then, then you can use your data to, to make uh, claims, conclusions, uh, you know, come up with findings. Now I'll show you some details uh, why, uh, why we did this and why researchers have to be very careful. This graph uh, kind of summarizes the number of new deaths. It's the ratio of the number of new deaths over the total number of uh, zip codes that uh, had deaths. As you can see in the beginning, the, the uh, uh, let me see if I can, yeah, here. Uh, at the beginning, uh, the, the ratio is very high. Why? Because the zip codes are not that many. And of course, the uh, death numbers are high. So the phenomenon progresses, more or less follows the path that we were expecting. And then suddenly, suddenly after, uh, let's say, May, it, started, it starts going down. So for us, if, if any conclusions, especially conclusions involving race, um, the relationship of race with income or social determinants has to be drawn or tested, uh, the wave has to be fully manifested. And for us, fully manifest manifestation means that the, uh, uh, let's say the, the, the data, the ratio is stabilizing. One thing you guys have to think is, uh, what is the validity of the conclusions of publications that appear uh, before May in this period? I, I don't wanna comment on this, but uh, as you, you will see, as you will you see in this graph, uh, uh, things, the, the essential two measures of the phenomenon are, are moving. Uh, so testing anything is very problematic. Dr. Kalitz, we have a question. I see Amy has her hand Perfect. raised. Yes. 
Yeah, sorry, uh, asking another question. But the, so this this graphic that you're showing here that shows the um, right this this doesn't necessarily mean that cases are going down. It could be that there's just no. a geographic dispersion, right? That's that's what you're showing here is that there's a larger number well, of codes that at the beginning at the beginning the ratio because this is a ratio is high because the cases go up and the number of affected uh, of zip codes is low. Okay, so so that's why it's it's going up. On the way down, what happens? The number of new cases goes down, and more or less the number of new zip codes is stabilizing to a hundred and let's say a hundred and something. I don't remember the exact number. Okay, is that does that answer your question? Yep. Thank you. The the most important thing you have to take away from this graph and some other graph I'm gonna show you is that in order to study uh, anything related to, to, to a wave, you, you have to take data within, a, within a, a uh, before a stabilization zone. And of course, stabilization happened after, after July, sometime between July and August. The other big, big problem here, okay, and, and this is this has to do with people that um, uh, that that applies any special uh, metric to to assess the the disease. Uh, one big problem you have here is that the disease did not manifest itself in all the um, zip codes. Here we're using rates, death rates. As you can see, there are a lot of zip codes here in, you know, before, before April, uh, before the end of April that do not have uh, observations. Uh, by the end of the phenomenon, the distribution is totally different. You can see that on the right side uh, uh, map of Cook County. So this, again, raises many issues, methodological issues about conclusions that were stated uh, for uh, whatever was published uh, with data before April. In general, for studies, uh, we know that from environmental studies as well, uh, if you have a phenomenon that evolves, um, you can model it dynamically, but it takes a totally different approach. And then what you can do is mainly study trends. Um, and that's very valid, okay? Uh, now, anything else, for example, if you wanna do, uh, let's say any disparity study, uh, that's very problematic. Why? Because as you can see here, um, the final uh, phase of the pandemic has a totally different distribution from any other time slot before. Now, one thing that I'm not presenting, but you can find it in the uh, links that I provided is that this is wave one. Wave two has totally different characteristics. And this poses another problem is that, well, if you, for policy purposes, draw conclusions based on wave one data, uh, those conclusions and may, may, maybe, I don't know, but maybe even policies, okay, like uh, vaccine allocation or mitigation measures are not valid during the second wave. Um, so before we move on, Professor, um, someone else had a question. They were Perfect. saying, how valid is it to compare differences in cases over time? So for example, what if you took cases from May 2020 and compared them to cases from, uh, so March, sorry, May 2020, compared them from cases, compared them to cases from March 2021. Uh, I, can it, I can repeat yeah, that actually. Uh, uh, okay, sorry, sorry, we're not using cases, we're using mortality. And these are death rates. Okay. Um, we're, not, was, we're not using cases. I said that from the beginning. <laughs> So, well, I get, or maybe that's what they meant. They may have meant rates. Um, I, they can, I, um, I hope so. We, you, yeah. we, I, I mean, there are many reasons why we didn't use cases. It's, it's a very long list of reasons, okay? Yeah. Um, so the person who asked was Taylor. So if Taylor 
could unmute yeah. themselves and I guess. Yeah, I can ask. Sorry, I didn't mean to put cases. I was just. Oh, no, no, that's a very good something question. Something else that I'm interested in. But um, yeah, if you, so I, I, I get what you're saying that like, um, taking measurements at one point in time that given the pandemic, there's a different distribution of, of mortality given the point in time of the pandemic. But if you're comparing over time, like from death rates from May relative to March, 2021, is that more valid than just looking at one time period? Uh, well, well, again, uh, what we wanna uh, identify is the impact of the pandemic within the wave. So for us, the wave, well, okay, let's go here. So for us, the wave, and again, we separate the wave in terms of, of HP population and LTCF population. So for us, the wave starts early March, um, okay? And ends somewhere down here, some, sometime in, in August. We do not, this, this graph, if you're, uh, this, these two maps, uh, the reason we're, pre we're presenting them is just to show the, the, let's say the mistake of using uh, data that are not uh, accounting for uh, the completion of the wave. So for us, for us, oh, sorry. Oh, darn, I lost my, oh yeah. So for us, the, valid data to use is at the end of the wave. It's the, the graph here on the right. Is that, mm -hmm. is that? Uh... Yeah, so as a follow-up question, I understand what you're saying. So Perfect. for yeah. for policy um, makers who are like in the, right at the center of this pandemic, at what point should they provide recommendations, right? Because if the pandemic is constantly changing and they want to impact communities, at what point would you recommend that some of these decisions are made? Well, these, these again, uh, these maps, um, okay, uh, let me go. The, the, the issue here with the pandemic is, and, and, and it took us quite by surprise uh, we thought that the um, uh, map here on the right could be used for, let's say, predicting um, uh, hotspot areas uh, uh, during the second wave. Uh, so we waited, uh, and then when there is there there is a, a link that I can send you. Um, if, if you can provide your email, I can send you the specific link to the maps that we're showing the comparison. The second wave has totally different characteristics from the first one. So it, if you want to establish a policy uh, um, for let's say vaccination or mitigation measures, you have to um, uh, use uh, basically dynamic uh, ways of mapping the, the, the spread. You have to monitor it weekly. Now, again, these are death cases, okay? Um, we we do not we do not we did did not like at all positive cases, and and of course now the problem is uh, because of the vaccination programs we cannot use death cases anymore, but that's another story, okay? Did did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, so, so please send me uh, send us the email, and then I'll I'll, I'll give you the exact link uh, where we show it exactly the comparison uh, and and the, the policy implications. Um, and so the the last question, I guess, before we can move on. Um, so Delcy Sanders asked, "Are you saying that an observation can't be made until there's something to observe?" So you mean like uh, I, I think they meant like the end of the way, um, waiting till the wave ends, but they can also. Um, unmute and, and clarify their question as well if they wish to. Okay, so, so, so let's go now to the, the definition of the wave. Um, there, there, are two, there are two levels of analysis that you can apply. If depending on what, so, so the issue is if you wanna, let's say to, to uh, identify disparities, uh, you cannot identify disparities uh, 
with uh, the map, the spatial distribution of deaths uh, uh, in the middle, more or less, of the wave. Why? Because the areas, the impacted areas, are not well, are not yet manifested. And the big, big problem, again, uh, from a geostatistical point of view, is that uh, that uh, you'll have a lot of uh, zip codes with zero as uh, as a, as, a, as a rate. Now, conceptually, uh, does this make any sense? I mean, it's recorded. It is a real number. I'm not <laughs> I'm not arguing about that. But what I'm saying is. Uh, just because the phenomenon has not fully manifested itself, it doesn't mean that, that that zero will remain zero. So your conclusions are based on an incomplete phenomenon. And you can see that by comparing these two uh, maps. As you can see, especially here in the middle, uh, this community here, uh, which is, uh, let me yeah, these communities here actually are hard hit. And, you know, these communities are, are basically, uh, you know, minority communities. Um, in, in the map on the left side, uh, there's a lot of zip codes with zero, zero death rates. The, 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 does this cover your... Uh, did I answer your question. I really, you know, don't want to, uh, in any way, to avoid answering questions, okay, or being, you know, evasive. So, let me continue here. So, as you can see, the the two waves clearly established. No, no, they're not the two waves. The two constituents of the uh, overall population, more or less follow the, uh, confine, you know, have the same pattern when it comes to the wave and both of them level off at a plateau phase uh, sometime in August. Uh, an interesting thing to, uh, to look here is the, um, the, the moving averages, uh, moving average graph. Very useful graph, especially for, for highly volatile observations like this. Why? Because you can, Kind of compare the pattern of deaths for the two populations. And uh, this moving average is not based on a rate, it's based on raw numbers, and it's just a 14 day moving average. As you can see, uh, the, red, um, the red line is um, the uh, HP residential population, and the green line is the uh, LTCF. So uh, for, for whatever reasons, and there are many uh, explanations why, the LTCF was totally devastated when, let's say, the residential population was kind of balancing. Um, this is, a, I guess, a major, <laughs> a major issue. And, and in a way, it underlines that during emergencies, and we saw that as well with flooding and other disasters, that, that health in, in, inequalities will come to the forefront. Um, the reading material you have is really excellent on this topic, has a very nice discussion, and, and you should pay attention to it. Now, the other thing that that uh, we want to point out to especially researchers uh, is that if you do, if you analyze your data properly, and in this case, just by separating your data, you can uh, get meaningful patterns. Here again, we can see that during this disaster, uh, families with income uh, below the poverty level were really hard hit. Now, if you don't do your job properly and you don't separate the data, you get this graph. Uh, I guess you can still make conclusions, but I prefer to use this one. And we did actually, why? Because, you know, for modeling purposes, those that are familiar with uh, modeling of data, um, uh, this, this can be, uh, 
this can, can yield better models as opposed to this. Now, in terms of race, that's something that as well, that was revealed by doing this separation. And this, this again, um, uh, I think at least that during disasters, uh, the most uh, vulnerable uh, people in a society will be the hardest hit. So we already know that the uh, old people living in, in LTCFs were extremely hard hit. And what we see here is that in Cook County, the black population of the city was extremely hard hit at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. Any questions? So maybe a small break. Hello? Yeah, we can take a quick break. Yeah. It, it, I mean, or maybe, you know, if you have any questions on anything, please, well, anything related to the topic, okay, please ask. Just to catch our breath or my breath. Yeah, Amy put in the chat, I think the major takeaway so far is we, we need to really understand our data and think through potential complications before we try to present or explain results. Exactly. And and this brings us back to the, the to actually the, um, the reading paper you, uh, you, you said to everyone uh, um, really stated clearly, you really need to look at your data. Spend time understanding it, graphing them. Uh, I mean, I'm assuming you clean them <laughs> because it's, that's, a, that's a major effort as well. Uh, the other problem that uh, I, I see with the um, data portals that are out there is um, uh, they provide data and, and, and this, is, this is a more advanced discussion, but I think we can have it is the data they provide are at different scales of aggregation. So some portals provide um, data at a census tract level, others at a zip code level, and so on and so forth. Um, and that, that, this creates problems if you want to do research and you don't know just statistical techniques to, let's say, um, aggregate at any level you want. Uh, mind you, and this is important, uh, if, if you do not have data uh, in an appropriate scale and you want to aggregate at another scale, let's say from census tract, which is quite low, group, uh, no, um, block groups is probably the lowest that you can find. And let's say you want to go, um, well, let's say you want to go from zip code to a lower aggregation. One way of doing that is to take into account uh, population density and come up with estimates. And there's a big debate here is, are these estimates reliable? Um, you know, I just, I just want you to uh, think of these things, okay? Why? Because I'm sure you're gonna be um, using such data in your careers. Uh, how are we doing in time? I better rush, <laughs> okay. So what did we do? Uh, you know, based on the information um, some infectious disease expert gave us is that uh, this was just the first wave. So there might be a second, a third, and some people are even discussing of a fourth wave in certain parts of the world. So what we've done uh, is uh, sit down and think uh, one way to, to present this information is to use uh, the, the something called dashboards that I'm sure you're familiar with by now, I hope, because there's so many out there. <laughs> okay. Now, the way we design our dashboards, and as you can see it here, is that um, uh, we have three of them, and our and we're explaining, you know, details of the design parameters. But the most important design parameter for us was parameters that can make that that users can make comparisons with 
So the first dashboard, and this is in your materials. Um, uh, now let me now, I think I'll have to stop sharing and go to this. Okay, so, but, but let's talk about it before we go there and, and show you the um, dashboard. So, so what we wanted to do in our dashboards is to show, to make comparisons that, that, that show, uh, let's say, um, discrepancies. Uh, discrepancies, let's say, between uh, urban and rural centers, okay? Are they differences? That's for us was very, very reliable. The other problem that we faced at, at a dashboard level uh, covering the Midwest is that there, were, there was no way to find uh, a zip code level, a low level of data. Uh, the only data that we managed to find was at a county level. And at a county level, uh, uh, we had to combine two totally different sources with numerous problems, okay? in order to come up with the HP and LTCF populations. Now for us, another comparison, uh, not only rural, urban, is, is to use um, comparisons that indicate socioeconomic position, as your reading material says, not status. And that's fine with me. <laughs> um, uh, so what we've done is we used, uh, for this purpose, density, population density. And in, in, the, in our number, the population density number, we excluded the group quarters population, okay? So it's just the residential population density. This, this uh, parameter is very important, as you can imagine. Uh, why? Because it kind of shows as well the density, the proximity of, of people living together. And as you know from the pandemic and the social distancing uh, measures, uh, close proximity is not a good thing. So let me stop sharing and go to the dashboard. Oops. Oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> I don't know anyone here, so that's not nice, but um, okay. So please go to your material. There's a material um, PDF that all of you have. And go students, to the it's also posted to Blackboard so you can always access it. Okay, okay. And go to the first dashboard. Uh, let me now sh share my screen. Let me find it now. Oh, here it is. So the introduction is basically the text. And here you can see the criteria, the, our design criteria for dashboards. A few, you know, uh, a, few, a week actually, after we came up with this whole thing, there was a publication, I think, in the Washington Post uh, pointing out uh, the, the, the problems with these dashboards that are all over the place. Um, uh, one thing you can see here is uh, we separated left, right. One is the LTCF, the other one is the household population. Uh, we provide states. And here, the very interesting thing is the date. So you can see the evolution the spatial evolution of the um, uh, disease. Again, we're using rate data, don't, okay, let's keep it. Now, one thing for us, the, the, you know, as I said before, uh, but I don't know if we have time, so that I'll go to, uh, how much time do I have, sorry? It's 6.45, so about 15 minutes to walk till our usual seven of oh. break. Okay, and then whoever wants can stay, correct? Correct. Okay, so let us let me go to the essential, the, the one that shows real differences, then, then we can proceed to the last one. So this is the, let's say, most interesting thing. Why? Because uh, you see what I, I pointed out before, that the two waves have totally different characteristics in terms of density. So here you can see that high in the, during uh, wave one, highly 
you know, areas with high density had high death rates. You can see that in the, let's say around Chicago, Cook County area and in other major metropolitan areas. During the second wave, this is not true anymore. you start having high death rates at low density areas. Uh, my favorite state is Ohio. So this is Ohio, wave two, wave one. So I guess in terms of policy, and this goes to the uh, good question uh, that the, the lady uh, posed uh, before, is that in terms of policy, you have to apply a dynamic uh, surveillance program. Uh, why? Because the two waves are totally different. And we address the issue actually in the, uh, and I'll go directly, I'll go directly to the third. I'll skip the second dashboard and go to the third, which is the vaccine prioritization um, dashboard. So as you can see here, um, wave one and wave two are totally different, uh, totally rural areas for whatever reason. And there are many reasons I heard, but here we go. Uh, this is North Dakota. Wave one, almost nothing, and wave two, uh, which is a big disaster. Uh, this is rate data, as I said. And um, I mean, there's no, there, there's, you can even see the graphs uh, showing the waves per state, um, if you want, in the, uh, the, next, the, tab, the next tab. So let me now, Stop sharing. <coughs> any any questions? Uh, please, uh, there's no, any questions? Maybe uh, what's this thing here? <laughs> this, this is just a, a county with no observations. Uh, so let me stop share. Um, I have a question. Oh, very good. I'm curious to know, I, I imagine these, this uh, technique of looking at data kind of on the fly and as as the, the issue develops is kind of newer because now we have these surveillance systems that make it easier to gather data quickly and mm -hmm. share it, right? So have, I guess in your experience, do you think that the public health system is kind of like up to date on using that technology and you know, we're talking about the importance of using this and how it could be yep. used. Is that real? Is it realistic? <laughs> this is a really great question. Why? Because it, it proves that that um, the agencies uh, are so um, not coordinated between them. Okay, uh, that it's almost impossible to get reliable information. One reason for us it was that it was impossible to go at a zip code level. Uh, is that there's no zip code level data for all those states. And mind you, um, you, can find, you can find in some cases zip code levels if you request them from public health departments, but that, that's a long story and some people did. Uh, but if you wanna do a comprehensive study, there are no portals, portals that can give you that information. And the other thing is, as I said before, uh, even the uh, IDPH that did a great job, okay, um, does not provide uh, data that you can segregate the overall population from the LTCF population. Why? Oh, I, uh, I mean, I think I showed you the example. Now, what we've done for the second and third dashboard is we combine two totally different databases. And it was, a, it was not an easy problem to solve, okay? Uh, and again, we have a lot of limitations and we're measuring them in the, um, in the um, dashboards. So, okay, let me go fast to the, sorry, uh, but I think, 
uh, I think this is the, uh, yeah. This is, a, let's see, a good dashboard. Why? And I'll explain you why when you'll see it. Uh -oh. Connection takes time. I guess all of you are, are rushing to go there. It's the third dashboard uh, about Cook County, Illinois. And, oh, finally. Okay, let me share my screen now. Now, why? Why is it good? Uh, it's based on the medical examiner's data. So one thing here is that we have observations that are XY. XY for us are the best possible observations. Why? Because we can aggregate at any level we want. Um, for those of you that are familiar with biostatistics, the problem is if you keep on aggregating your data and going to high levels like zip codes, uh, then you have something, uh, uh, something similar to the ecology fallacy that I'm, I, I, you have to realize I'm not an epidemiologist, okay? I don't have any background whatsoever. Uh, for people that are in the geostatistic field, uh, this is the famous MADP problem, uh, modifiable area unit problem. So, if you aggregate at a high level, it's very likely uh, that if you test assumptions, those assumptions will be significant. And they'll be significant just because you aggregate. So that's why we we're very happy to create this dashboard. Why? Because it's, a, it's at a census tract level. And for all practical purposes, that's a very good level to analyze data. Again, geostatistically speaking, okay? Uh, let me share my screen now and show you this dashboard. Uh, so this is the introduction. So uh, what, what, what seems to be uh, applied now is that a lot of states are using vulnerability indices to come up with prioritization of the, their vaccination programs for the overall population. I'm not talking about the above 70 and the essential workers. Um, the issue is, the big issue is that, we, you know, uh, the states have limited supply of vaccines. So how are you gonna vaccinate people? We're preparing, we're preparing right now as we speak another dashboard which will show the, um, let's say the uh, effect, well, well, kind of the effectiveness of vaccinations. It's not exactly, but uh, we have the vaccination numbers. The problem of course, is that it's at the county level because there's no way to find lower aggregation level data. So what we've done here in this third dashboard is we're using, um, uh, these so-called CCVI, um, it's a vulnerability index, a COVID, community COVID vulnerability index, uh, quite good index uh, that was created. Um, it has seven components. And the one you can see here is the summary component of those seven components. So, the big problem with all these uh, indices, and if you go the city of Chicago, and this is the city of Chicago here, as you can see the outline, is using it. It's using two of the seven components. Now, if you go to the introduction, and if we have time, we did a, some kind of an assessment here with our methodology that we developed of these two components, theme one, theme two. Uh, but let's go back here, and this kind of, shows very clearly, I think, the disparity issue, okay, um, in terms of distribution. Uh, so one way to show uh, if there is disparity, and if we assume that the city or the state will go ahead and vaccinate based on this uh, CCVI, is to compare the CCVI with the uh, death rates. Uh, why? Uh, because the assumption that the city is making is that the city and the state probably will make is that high death areas are the most vulnerable areas. Uh, what we found here, and it's it's really well substantiated in the paper you have uh, as well, uh, 
throughout the Midwest is that this is not the case. That's the previous dashboard. Uh, here, uh, and you can see, you have areas, the blue areas, and you can click on them and find out, oh, new cities. Okay, I know them, I know it very well. Uh, you can see that it has a very low death rate and a high CCBI. So these areas, mind you, these are um, census tract areas, okay? So the definition is very good. Uh, so these areas uh, have um, an extremely high vulnerability, but for whatever reason, their death rate is low. Um, the opposite as well is true. Their, their areas, uh, here, here you can see the, the red color, okay? With high, high death rates and low, low, low vulnerability. Ideally, what you want to do for allocation purposes is to uh, allocate as, as a first priority your vaccines to the um, high death rate and high CCBI areas. If, and I really don't know what the city is doing, but they, they, they have some kind of a vulnerability index which is at a zip code level or something close to a zip code level, they're using the um, community areas um, to allocate vaccines, which is another issue as well, as we said before. Um, so if you use uh, these uh, vulnerability indices to allocate uh, vaccines, it's very likely that the, um, let's say the, the approach will not be very effective. Why? Because you're going to be vaccinating areas, the blue areas that um, did not have a high death rate. So Any we had a, oh, sorry, we had a question. Um, so um, someone said that you had mentioned, and they can also clarify, that IDPH uses county level data, which does include LTCF mortality. Um, but they said they didn't think the data is separated to show other subpopulations, and they were curious as to why you thought that was the case. So, so sorry, can, can you repeat your question? Um, I guess, was it Stephanie Salgado? Do you want to, like, clarify? Yeah, 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 please, please, yes. Oh, no, can you repeat your question, I said? Oh, uh, oh it, was a, it was a student's question, so Stephanie can clarify it. Yeah, my question was just why, why do you think IDPH isn't separating the data to show other subpopulations. I think you mentioned they are showing LTCF mortality, but oh. what about other subpopulations? I don't know. What do you uh, it's not only the IDPH. Actually, the, the IDPH from the beginning was one of the few um, state agencies that provided the information, even, even in the way they were providing it, which was, uh, as, as I showed, um, <coughs> in terms of name, facility name. Very awkward way to, to present it, but it's better than nothing. Uh, I, I, I really don't know, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Um, I, as I said, I, I'm not an epidemiologist, okay? Uh, in terms of geostatistics and, and data analytics, it doesn't make any sense, okay? So researchers, uh, if they want to have valid conclusions, they need to separate the data. As you, as you saw, and, and conceptually as well, I mean, since you're talking about community disparities, you, can, you, cannot, you cannot join two communities that are fundamentally different. Uh, residential neighborhoods have certain characteristics. The LTCFs have totally different characteristics. Right now, actually, what we're doing, because we, we, we have access to the data um, that were recently published, um, from federal sources, uh, we're trying to see if there's any racial disparities within these um, LTCFs. Uh, mind you, a lot of these LCTFs are, um, are as well the um, luxury uh, community, living communities, you know, with even golf courses in them, okay? Uh, so so if, if, if you really want to study um, uh, areas like that, you, you want to figure out what's going on. The CMS database 
is really, really good because it provides uh, the sources of funding for these um, uh, care facilities. It, now, one thing you have to keep in mind, the, the data source for uh, care facilities uh, around the states, which pro is provided by CMS, is not the same as the one we have for for um, Cook County. We found all those um, LTCFs, which includes not only uh, care facilities, includes all the facilities, uh, the long-term care facilities, assisted living facilities, luxury facilities, whatever you want, uh, in Cook County. Uh, and that's why we can have maps like this that go down to the CT level. Um, any, any? Uh, yeah, so Taylor, then Randy, and then uh, LaShonda. Oh, please. T Taylor? Oh, should I ask? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, because, um, yeah. It's just easier than me read, misreading the questions. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if you had any, um, I don't know, any like reasonings for why the high vulnerability locations have lower death rates, especially since they're using information that really accounts for death by locations. I'm, I'm wondering why that association exists. Uh, the association in terms of what the the you mean the yellow uh, the the yellow cities? Well, yeah, you pointed. You said that many of the high vulnerability locations had low death rates, and that in some locations ah. where there's high death rates, there's low vulnerability. So, what explains that difference? So, you would expect so you're, there to be you, high death correct. and high vulnerability. So, you're talking about the uh, blue ones, correct? Yes. Good. Uh, very good question. Uh, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it's um, there. There are many issues. One issue that 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 I think is, is important, and, and I, I posed it as a question in your document, is uh, it, it's a more fundamental question: Are these indices appropriate for epidemiological studies? You see, when we say high vulnerability, what does that mean? Uh, this is a linear uh, summation of seven components. So does the index really represent vulnerability? And when we're talking about vulnerability, are we talking, uh, we're talking about vulnerability to disease. Uh, we're not talking about vulnerability to a disaster. Um, now, all these methodologies that you'll see, there is the paper that we, we published, um, uh, the pre prelim preliminary paper that we published, uh, the, 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 this work that we've done it was based on disasters. Mind you, the, the other index, the index that the CDC is proposing is an index developed for disasters, not for um, uh, epidemics. The CCVI, the interesting thing about the CCVI, they included variables, epidemiological variables. And in the paper, I think, if not, uh, I can send it to you, in the paper uh, that, that, that you can find, it's in the, um, in the material PDF that uh, was uh, distributed, um, we evaluated separately ju just this epidemiological component of the CCVI, and we found the same problem. And if you go here in the, the introduction, uh, since you asked the question, it's not my fault if I'm taking more time, we have a methodology basically to do validation. As I said, we're old school, so for us, validation is, is fundamental. Uh, why? Because we don't want arguments with people saying, well, you know, um, you know, uh, the COVID is a, is a plot or a conspiracy or whatever. Um, so we develop a methodology that compares these indices in terms of categories with actual disaster losses, in this case, death rate. 
so uh, this comparison actually, this, these are the two theme ones, sorry, but my memory these days is not theme one. Oh, here it is. Uh, socioeconomic status and household composition and disability. Those are two components that the um, CCVI of the city of Chicago is using. Uh, as you can see here, this cell here contains 21 CTs, okay? And this cell has the highest, let's say, death rate, and it's the, the, the least vulnerable. So if you prioritize your uh, vaccinations based on this theme only, you're gonna be exposing 62,000 people to a potential risk. If I have the other, so if you, if you on the other hand, do not, let's say, prioritize this entire area here. Uh, why? Because it's, um, let's say, low priority. I have the numbers here. Uh, you're going to be exposing a more than a million people to risk. Now, I didn't adjust the numbers here for age, but that can be done easily with this methodology that we're proposing here. Now, did, did I answer your question? Yes, okay. thank you. No, 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 you can always email me as well, by the way, so. Um, okay, we have Randy and then LaShonda. Right, oh, right. Oh, you muted yourself, Randy. There you go, you're unmuted. Oh, now. shoot, I was unmuted when I meant to be muted and muted it. I meant to be unmuted. Uh, that's okay. I don't think I was making any noise. Um, I asked. I asked a question about policy. Um, I'll stick with it. Uh, I, I guess I wonder if there's any effort that you know of being done to make this kind of distinction known or acted upon by policymakers or those who kind of have the power to um, control where vaccines uh. and efforts are being done. We did our due diligence. Uh, I, I sent, uh, I don't know how many emails to the uh, Chicago Department of Public Health. Um, and, and on top of that, because as I said, I, you know, we did, we present these methodologies to California. Uh, they gave me access to the list of public health departments in, in the entire Midwest and all the states that are highly hit by COVID. And we distribute this information. So, I, I mean, beyond that, I really don't know what to do, okay? Unless you have a suggestion. I don't, I just wanted to know what, yeah, you know, what, what, what was done and I guess what doesn't seem to work like as well as you'd want it to work. Well, as I said before is what, what the states and the city needs to do is somehow optimize for us, I mean, us meaning for engineers, optimization is something real, something that can be done. Uh, for me, if I see, when I see these blue areas, uh, that's a waste of vaccines. Why? Because there are other areas that need them. And, and, and you know, talking about disparities and equitable allocation, this is an issue, isn't it? I mean, think about it, okay? Uh, here you have high death rates, high C uh, CCVI areas. So those areas will be, you know, covered. But what happens to the high death rates, low CCVI areas? I mean, you, I mean, you see what I'm saying? So these red areas here, okay, down here, uh, let me give it a name. For example, the Pullman area. Uh, this Pullman area, there's another one next to it, which is worse. Okay? I don't know why it's uh, low CCVI, but it's low CCVI, okay? Um, why should this area be uh, low in the priority list? 
let me find another area here, actually. Beverly, okay. It, it, anyway, I mean, this is public domain. I, I, I really don't know. This, this is a policy issue that uh, I cannot really address. The only thing I know is that the city is doing some effort uh, and they're using as a tool um, a vulnerability index. You can read all about it. That unfortunately is done at a at a at, at a very high level, community area level, uh, which implies many many uh, problems. So why? Because just to give you an idea, uh, let's get a very diverse. So this area is um, Auburn area. You see, one community area has oh many many. Uh, subdivisions in terms of vulnerability. So bagging them all together is not an efficient use of, of, of uh, resources. We know that as well in terms of disasters. So for, for you guys, since most of you, I, you know, I, I think are epidemiologists, I really don't know you. So, so for you, the question is, uh, are these indices appropriate for, uh, let's say, epidemiological studies? And then lastly, oh, sorry. And then we also had LaShonda. I, I mean, I personally think based on what you're showing us, it's not, and as someone who's trying to find a particular vaccine because of my health complications. Um, and uh, we did not talk about maybe if we have time, we can discuss the vaccine scandals that have been happening that have disproportionately impacted uh, vaccine distribution. We can talk about the way the city's vaccine equity plan is or isn't working. Um, but I know like Shonda had uh, um, her hand up for a moment. So she definitely has a question. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Kalis. Um, Hello. This is Lashana. So I am probably one student you may know because I am on the CEP committee with you uh, on those four Thursdays. Um, so I think all of this is really fascinating with the maps, but I did want a little bit of a clarification because maybe I missed it. So with the long term, long, long term care facilities that are within like residential communities. Because I'm thinking, because some of the highest populations was 606, 19, and 20, and I live in 21, which is really next door. So okay. do they do they kind of clump, like, I get, you explain it a little bit, like, like the more higher end versus like maybe like a senior building or something. Because I know Auburn Gresham really does have a lot of senior living suites. Um, and I live actually next to two. So do they just take that number outside of the zip code and calculate it differently? as opposed to like rates, because I'm, I was trying to figure out like, if this senior building is within this zip code or within this community. Oh, um, so this is a very good question. Um, yeah, because I was, that's why I was trying to wonder like- Well, if, if you, you know, go to the IDPA site and, uh, you know, um, I, I, I mean, um, I can send you the link. Uh, the IDPA site has all the, um, LTCF facilities, uh, but but the problem with them is they have them per name. They don't have them per address. So if you know the name of the facilities in your neighborhood, you can immediately identify them. Oh, okay. And then that's how you will know if that those numbers are different or, or separated Correct. from the rest of the community population. No, 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 no. The the, the way we do it though is is a totally different way. Um, okay. We, we're and, and I'll I'll tell you the um, the secret, which is not a secret, by the way. It's in the dashboards in the introduction here. Okay, uh, the way we do it is we combine two different databases. One is the uh, database, but the, uh, the 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 basic stream that uh, John Hopkins is using, and that database gives us the overall population deaths. And then we go to a totally different database, which is the CMS uh, portal that provides it's throughout the US um, weekly numbers of deaths in care facilities. Okay. Now, 
Now, well, there's a catch here. These are care facilities. They're not long-term care facilities. Oh, okay. Which means that our uh, care facilities with certain level of uh, certification. The problem with the LTCFs that we found out is that there's so many uh, that are just, uh, they just provide living accommodations to people that pay a lot of money. Uh, and unfortunately with this pandemic, those facilities for whatever reason, um, and there are many reasons, uh, they were extremely hard hit. As you saw the numbers, okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not making up anything, okay? The numbers are there and, and you can see the raw data as well. Um, does this answer your question? Yeah, because that, that, yeah, because I was wondering, like you said, I guess long term is different. So if, you, if like actually maybe... if you know if you know your facilities, uh, I can look it up. I can look them up in our database. Okay, I think uh, I do. So so I mean, if you know the address of your facilities, or the other way is if you know their name, then you can go to the IDPH um, portal and find the information you want. Thank you. No, my pleasure. Nice talking to you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, this has just been really great. Um, I mean, were there any other uh, questions? I'm looking to see if anyone else has their hands up, but if there are any other questions, you can always just unmute yourself and ask. No, oh. I can see hands and, and, and faces and names. Oh, yeah. Uh, Taylor, yes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yes, sorry. I had a quick question again. I was wondering, so since social vulnerability is not the best to use for infectious diseases, what... So, sorry, can, can you please repeat your question? Yes, I was wondering if in, like social vulnerability is not the best to use for infectious diseases, what other factors or um, oh. data would you recommend instead to support, like, I, I think the purpose is really to find high-risk populations and so I know some people use like the area deprivation index. I'm not sure if that's better. Than... Uh, I'm familiar with it as well. Yeah. Um, do you, well, how do you feel about that index instead? We, we have a totally different approach. What, what, and, and actually we're starting now to publish it. Okay. We've start, I started this many, many years ago, but, but finally it's catching up and I, I can, you know, have the time. What we're doing basically is we're considering vulnerability as a classification issue. Um, so if, if you do that, uh, uh, what happens then is that um, uh, there are ways, uh, well, we don't call them statistical ways, they're data analytic ways to model classification. And that's what we're doing. Uh, we already uh, did that in a preliminary publication for uh, a disa disasters in, flood disasters in the Houston area. Mind you, disasters have many things common with this epidemic as well. And that's why they're using the vulnerabilities. So this is a totally different way. Uh, what this approach does is that it it gives you estimates, classification estimates. You saw the boxes that I showed you before. They're in the third um, dashboard. Uh, what the methodology, the classification modeling methodologies do, and there are many of them, by the way, is they uh, provide basically uh, the best optimization of those boxes. So the diagonal elements, which are basically perfect matches in terms of risk and, and outcome uh, are maximized. Did I answer your question? Yes, that was great. And just as a follow-up, can you talk a little bit more about the area deprivation index being used or whether or not you feel like it should? Well, one, for one study, we tried to use it, but it's only at a CT level, I think. And, and rightly so, by the way, the people that developed, developed it are really people that know geostatistics. Um, 
And, and they even warn you if you use it, at, uh, if you use anything like that at a, at a more advanced level, you're going to have MAUP problems, okay? And it's, they're totally correct. So the other problem that I want to point out with all these studies that you, you, you can see about COVID is they're done at a, a, a county level. And as I said, at a county level, if you test anything, especially with the traditional statistical methods, uh, very likely you're going to find significant parameters and you're going to be very happy with your publication. The big problem is that eventually somebody will come by and say, well, you know, uh, you did not account for the MAUP. Um, that's why I have the good old Latin saying that um, words fly, uh, written words remain. So years from now, somebody, maybe you, uh, will sit down and, 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 and review a few of these cases and, and maybe criticize them the, the way they should be criticized, okay? So scale, again, I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that in your epi uh, classes, for, but for geostatistics or for, for us dealing with environmental issues, scale is extremely important, okay? If we do a study of um, uh, contamination, okay, and we go at a county level, uh, if I do that, all my colleagues will be laughing, okay? I'll be laughed out of uh, existence, okay? Uh, it's totally unacceptable for us. We have to go really at a very low level for many reasons. Now, going at a low level has another problem, okay? And, and I think a lot of these publications, they've done them because they, it was impossible to go at a low level. Uh, what's the problem? They're not, a lot, of, a lot of the CTs, a lot of the census tracts do not have observations. So you see, you're, you're kind of caught between uh, a rock and a hard place. Um, and, and, and there's no answer to it. The NAUP actually, you know, probably if, if somebody figures out how to solve this problem, we'll get a Nobel Prize, okay? Uh, there's no way to solve it. The only thing you can do is do a comparison of, of significant testings uh, between two different aggregations. And, 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 you know, see if there is a difference. Now, if there is a difference, you make the statement that I have a may UV problem. Sorry, bad news, but that's reality, you know. And, and the interesting thing for you guys, since, you know, you, you, you know, you do disparities is that if you want to test for disparities, you have to really be careful about the scale. There's even one publication that a student was showing me that was claiming that in order to study disparities, you have community area level is the best. Um, uh, I, what can I say? I mean, Any questions? We had someone post on the discussion board. Um, Perfect. So dis disability status isn't something currently being kept track of with um, the medical examiner data. And so do you think there's a, a way to include disability in a future study uh, like this one? If so, how? So and so kind of related also by age. Uh, age, age is there. Age, you can you can easily adjust things for age. The reason we didn't do it is that, you know, especially during the uh, right now we're writing the first wave <laughs> papers, okay, uh, for many reasons, okay. Um, uh, why? Well, most of the hard hit uh, age range was above, you know, 70, 80, okay, uh, for both populations. There was not a real significant difference. Um, um, so age indeed can be um, accounted for uh, and, and, and sh should be accounted for, okay? Uh, the, the, is disability the other question? Yes. Uh, the, and I'm not sure the ME has that kind of information. 
I haven't seen, I haven't seen, uh, no, I haven't seen that. No, no, it's not in one of their attributes, sorry. There's no, and I really don't know how to extract that information. Uh, They do not reveal that, and no, they don't. No, sorry, I, the more I think about it, no. Now, mind you, we're really lucky uh, as a city to have the ME uh, data source. The only problem, and that's why that, not that many people uh, are, are, are not using it, is that it, it really takes a lot of work to clean it up. And, and, and you got a, a, just a feeling of, 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 of what this cleaning up means. Our process is iterative. So we do a one round of, let's say, cleaning up the data as the addresses. And then when we're kind of okay with the outcome, we send it to our um, uh, geocoding um, uh, platform. Now, geocoding means what? Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, let's speak in simple English. You plug in the address and then the, the uh, software will uh, find from the address the coordinates by comparing it to a, a huge database that they have. So uh, just to give you, you know, the, um, the sad part of the story, I'm not trying to discourage you. Uh, the, um, the, uh, we had to do five iterations uh, with last month's data in order to come up with, let's say, less than a 1% conversion error, which means 95% of our addresses are correct, more than 95% of addresses. Now, if you take the original ME data, you're gonna have a conversion rate close to seven, between 70 and 80% which means you're losing 30% of your records. You won't be able to geocode them. So this is, this is another aspect of, of, of data that you know, we did not really cover, but it, it, it is a reality that you people should understand. Um, the other problem, of course, is that uh, the CMS data, if you try to geocode those, they have addresses, and sometimes the addresses have problems as well. <laughs> okay. And CMS has done an exceptional job in terms of data quality. That's why they lag behind in terms of reporting data. It takes them, sometimes they're back by almost two, three weeks, okay? But their data are extremely reliable, and, and there are publications based on that data now that are coming out. Very interesting, actually, uh, kind of studying the impact of community on LTCFs uh, in terms of spreading the disease, which is something you guys uh, know very much about. Well, thank you so much. Does anyone have no, any pleasure. last questions? All right. Well, with that, thanks so much for being our speaker this week. I certainly learned a lot. And, oh, I hope uh, so. <laughs> yeah, seeing uh, these dashboards if, and if action you have, is really awesome. If you have any questions, uh, you know, about the dashboards, uh, you have all the information and I'll, I'll, I'll be sending you as well the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, please email me or uh, email Alexis and I'm sure she can track me down, okay? <laughs> Yes, anyway, absolutely. I'll be seeing Lasanda next week, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> if you have a question, please ask me, okay? Before or after the meeting, our meeting, okay? Again, thank All you right. so much. Really great, great questions. Um, you know, um, I hope I can see you in one of my classes to, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, live it up. But <laughs> Someone um, asks, is there a part B? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, this okay. was a great introduction. So we look forward okay. to seeing those papers come out. Okay, bye-bye guys. Thank you so much for uh, a great class. Okay, uh, Glake the Richer, okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.